Welcome to Story to Camera. And this week, we go to Crossmid Glen with our first story. The Chief Constable of the PSNI, Simon Byrne, did a Christmas Day tweet from Crossmid Glen in which he was photographed with the PSNI officers outside Crossmid Glen Police Station while carrying machine guns. He has since apologised. But the story continues, and we get local reaction. Uh, well, our view, I suppose, in the town in general, what, what I can see is... Uh, a lot of disappointment in the people, um, you know, we definitely don't see or want Cross McGlenn to be portrayed in the way that that picture uh, has come across and I suppose there's a, a deep sense of anger within the community that we, uh, we're being delved back into the past over this picture and it's, it's not a true reflection of Cross McGlenn. Yes, the truck run is one of our, our events that we have been running now for five years and the last three years we, we've introduced the PSNI to come along to help us marshal it and steward it and it's proper policing where the police wear their high vis vests and the last two years we had even got the motorcycles cops out helping us as well to do traffic control and on the ground it was a big success. There is nothing but positivity from the people in Cross McLean, as you can gather from even the, 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 the day that they turned the, the, the lights on for Christmas, the place was full of children, was full of parents, um, the activity around the town was just great. Well, joining me right now on Story to Camera, we have Chris Brennan, who's the deputy editor of the Newry Democrat, and also Wayne Denner, who is a social media and technology commentator. Well, strong sentiments indeed from the local businesses in Crossmid Lane. Right now, we've gone to the hub of it all in Newry City and we've gone to one of the leading papers, the Newry Democrat, and the deputy editor, Chris Brennan, joins us right now. And Chris, we're, we're looking at Crossmid Lane. What's your view? And there is an update. Well, there is. I mean, it's certainly to go back, Kevin, uh, to the start, the community were certainly very upset by the, the nature of the tweet um, on, on Christmas morning. And I think that in itself was um, particularly poignant, a, a Christmas Day message, and they see the police in their local community uh, militarised, essentially, and it almost was uh, as if it was saying to them that you're different, that this is what policing in Cross McGlenn uh, requires from our point of view, and that upset the community very much. Now, as you say, there has been an update to it in the sense that the PSNI have uh, addressed the issues and the, the furore really that created from that there um, in a press conference where whilst acknowledging the the upset uh, that was caused that uh, essentially they feel that that is representative of policing for their members in Cross McGlenn. How, how much damage has been done here? Well, there's no doubt there's been damage. Um, from my point of view and from a communications point of view, it wasn't the right thing to do. I think the people in the communications department need to sort of take a look at that. So um, you're suggesting maybe that he didn't get the right advice? I don't think the right advice fundamentally was given. I think um, from a social media point of view, when content uh, makes its way online, it amplifies. And that's not the sort of message that we want to be seeing on Christmas morning. I know that I spend a lot of time out in Cross McGlenn. I was recently out there delivering a workshop just before Christmas. And I can see the, the sentiment that, that would leave uh, in the area whenever an image like that makes its way online. So perhaps a lesson learned for the PSNI? I think so, absolutely. And let's look at our rail and certainly, Chris, the Nara Water Bridge situation. What's happening there? Well, as you say, Kevin, there's been a, a situation where there's been a, a number of um, plans to upgrade Newry and the, the centre of it uh, in terms of the, the rail links, transport links as well, and that's where the narrow water bridge development does come in. And we are in a position now where hopefully that will uh, gather some momentum. And is there money available? It seems that there is money available. Um, certainly that seems to be the initial... Um, thrust of the opinion so far and certainly you would imagine now that we have devolved assembly back that the the funds will be there available for it because it's been something that has been talked about for a long long time and it would seem that the time is now right for it to go ahead hopefully. But we're still very much in the dark. We don't know exactly. We haven't seen any documents to tell us exactly what's going to happen. Not at the moment, no. As we speak at the moment, it, it is a, a bit of speculation, I guess, and conjuncture at this point. But uh, certainly the feeling is that 
now is as good a time as we're ever likely to, to get it, uh, certainly in the very recent past anyway. What will it mean or do we know enough about it? I don't think at this stage we know enough about it and I think it's going to have to be revisited. It was a number of years now before the momentum uh, happened in relation to the narrow water bridge. There's no doubt it's going to be good for tourism. But maybe there's a bigger question to ask and that's why we need to look at that again in relation to the Southern Relief Road, that which um, project would actually take priority and which project would be of most benefit overall to the region, not just to tourism, but also to businesses as well. On the announcement of funding, the suggestion now is, is there enough money? And will that be the usual old war cry, sorry, we don't have enough money there? And again, I don't think we know enough about it yet to make that call, whether there is enough funding. A project of that size is going to require significant investment. And there's no doubt that over the past couple of years, since the narrow water bridge was first floated, excuse the pun, there will be changes in the investment required. So it's going to be interesting to see if both the Irish government and indeed the default government at Stormont have enough money in the coffers to fund it. Chris, finally, let's look at high-speed rail. The suggestion is a faster service between Belfast and Dublin. And this is one for Stormont uh, and the Irish government to agree on. Yes, absolutely. And uh, at, at the moment, we don't know what that is going to look like in terms of the shape that it will take. Certainly from the point of view of Newry, is it something that is going to benefit it um, in terms of will it go straight through? Will there be stops in terms of benefiting uh, commerce here in Newry and uh, perhaps jobs and footfall through it? We just don't know yet at the moment, um, but certainly it would be something that uh, could potentially be positive for Newry, depending on what details emerge of it. When you heard what Chris said about the high-speed rail, we don't really know enough about it. And, and how's it going to impact on, on the Newry area? You use this railway line quite a lot. I do, and I think it's an important connection for both Dublin and Belfast. And one of the sort of gripes I've had with it over the past couple of years has been its uh, connectivity in the sense that, you know, is it as frequent as business people would like it to be? There has been occasions, Kevin, where I've got on the train and you can't get a seat. So therefore, that presents an issue as well, where if people are getting on the train, let's say at Newry, where the train has been, you know, previously coming through Portadown or indeed starting off at Belfast, there has been an influx of people getting onto the train. That also presents an issue for passengers if they can't get their seat. So I think a little bit more work's going to need to be done in terms of scoping that out. There's no doubt it's a good idea, uh, given the impact environmentally that that might be able to help with, uh, taking more cars off the road. But as Chris mentioned, we're going to need to do a little bit more uh, research into that. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Wayne. Let's get your views now. Let's go out and about on the street with story to camera. Brexit, uh, for the first time in three years, we've got a government. So hopefully we've got a, a local MLA will look after the interests of not just the Northern Ireland people, but the people of Newry. Um, Brexit is, for me, for, for you know, Newry used to be famed for its uh, cross-border trade. Uh, I didn't see that this Christmas. I don't see it now. I see that we have to make a concerted effort, we have to uh, galvanise together and we have to make Brexit, whether we like it or not, work for us. Um, I think Brexit is going to be an economical and social disaster and I think for, I'm a youth worker myself and I think for young people in the area they'll the ones to see the real effect and change for it in a very negative way and especially the most disadvantaged members of our community including those that are um, poor and those that are homeless and you can see that from the rise in homelessness in Newry especially and across the north. Well the people voted for it so the, you have to be democratic and give the people what they want. Um, I, I think it'll go okay. I think uh, it, there'll be problems but they'll be resolved. We have a new government at Stormont. Are you hopeful? I'm very glad the government's back. Uh, to be honest I'm disgusted that uh, for three years there was no government in Northern Ireland because any country anywhere needs a government. Um, I think it's gone on a wee bit too long now. I'd rather it either be sorted or we just don't go ahead with it. Um, I'm from Scotland, so we didn't actually vote for Brexit to happen, but obviously over here, you guys weren't also in favour of it, were you, up in the we, north? We weren't in favour yeah. of Brexit at all. Um, well, I'm, I'm Scottish, so I want independence now. I'm just done with anything to do with England, so... Yeah, Brexit here in Newry, see, we didn't know what was going to happen and it's quite frightening, you know, to see what's going to happen and stuff like that. It's kind of scary because we didn't know what was going on with it. In terms of our government, we have a new government at Stormont, so tell us about that. Yeah, um, I hope the new government brings uh, better education, better schools, 
and even housing and more jobs even for just people in Newry. Well joining me right now is Colm Shannon, the Chief Executive of the Chamber of Commerce in Newry. Colm, a very happy new year to you. And a happy new year to you, Ken. Colm, lots has happened in the first two or three weeks of January. We now have a government in Stormont. What's your hopes for Northern Ireland? Yeah, it's all been a bit of a, a whirlwind and it's great to see our, our executive back and up and running again with uh, a new ministerial team uh, at the helm. We've missed them. Um, local ministers are much better than, than direct rule ministers. They have an understanding, uh, they have an empathy with the place and they want to do things. So, so it's great news. It's good news all right now. Conor Murphy, of course, we all know Conor. He's uh, the representative for Newry and Armagh an MLA from Kamla. He's now the finance minister. Will you be seeking a meeting very shortly to talk to him about Newry and Morn and also what will be on the table? Absolutely. Uh, it's great. I mean, Connor will be everybody's best friend. Everybody will want to speak to him. And indeed, there's a letter sitting on my desk uh, as we speak for uh, our president to sign and invite Connor. Uh, you can't really invite him to come down here given he lives here, but to come and engage and meet with, with local businesses. Uh, we have a lot of priorities and issues that we would like addressed. And perhaps, you know, a lot of people are talking about infrastructure, but the one major infrastructure project that we would like to see is the Southern Relief Road, which is part of the Belfast City Region deal. And Connor will be involved in the negotiations with the Treasury on that. So uh, we're really keen because we can see the impact that it would make economically in this area. Brexit's looming. It's been finalised now. It's going to happen. How prepared are we within our own community here? It's going to happen. And I suppose there is that tinge of disappointment. Um, uh, there isn't you know, a desire for it to happen here, but we've been given assurances that the border will remain open and we would want to see the UK government uh, to uphold those assurances. I think one of the challenges that businesses face, I mean, we don't just trade north-south, we trade east-west, and the lack of clarity uh, around how that is going to uh, be managed is something that needs to be resolved and needs to be resolved very, very quickly uh, because uh, December is going to come uh, rapidly. Decisions probably need to be made by the summer. Our businesses need to prepare for that. Uh, we had some very good sessions with local businesses in the autumn um, in the in the run up to the final decision on, on Brexit and it was clear some are prepared, the bigger companies are prepared, they have the resources, the ability and the skills to do that. Uh, some of our smaller companies were, were playing the wait and, uh, wait and see game but now we're leaving uh, so they have to prepare for what the future may hold. But the future really is depending on the nature of the trade deal that the UK government now negotiates over, over the next eight to nine months with the EU. In conclusion, Colm, you know, we're looking at 2020. What's the positives for businesses within Newry and Morn? Well, uh, Newry and Morn is one of the fastest growing uh, regional economies in the north. And what we want to see is that protected so that con companies here can continue to grow, can con continue to trade both north, south, east, west and globally. And I'd like to be sitting here this time next year to say that Newry is in a much better place and that we've had an executive that has delivered for us. Colm Shannon, Chief Executive of New Newry's Chamber of Commerce, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Well, let's welcome our next guest, Francis Gallagher. And Francis is the uh, chairman of the Action Group at Daisy Hill Hospital. And uh, Francis, first of all, welcome. Thank you, Kevin. And Francis, we've news about Daisy Hill and we have issues ongoing. Everybody's familiar about it. The stroke unit could be closed. We have mm -hmm. a problem there, serious problem. Uh, we've talked about it. We've had various meetings, which I have been involved with as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have an initiative that you want to tell everybody about, so please do. Yes, the, the Daisy Hill Hospital stroke unit is actually, is actually one of the best uh, performing stroke units in, in the whole of the UK. But there, as everyone knows, there is a shortage of doctors, not only in Daisy Hill, but throughout Northern Ireland as a whole. And um, Various efforts have been made to, to attract those doctors. Millions of pounds have been spent over this past few years by the Department of Health to try and attract doctors, but with very little success. So what did you do? So what I did was I said to myself, well, how, you know, what country in the world has got one of the best health services? And where has the Department of Health not tried yet 
in terms of attracting doctors from. And I thought, well, Cuba. So what I did was I emailed the Cuban ambassador in Dublin and I said to him, look, ambassador, we're, sh we're very short of doctors here in Newry City in the north here of Ireland. And could I meet with you to discuss the possibility of Cuba lending us doctors under its international medical scheme to work in Daisy Hill? And he said, yes, he said he would meet me and I was delighted with that. So I got my return ticket on the train to Dublin, a few euro for some to eat in Dublin. And went Which down. you paid for yourself. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I went down and I met the ambassador, uh, Ambassador Ramos, Hugo Ramos and uh, he was very, very friendly. And I just, we went straight to the point and I just said to him what I said in the email, we're very short of doctors, Ambassador and Daisy Hill, would you lend us some doctors under your, in, under your international medical scheme? And do you know what he said? He said, yes. Didn't hesitate. He didn't, he didn't hesitate w w whatsoever. And I, I was really, I was delighted with that. You know, I went into the office, there's a Cuban flag on one side, picture of Fidel Castro above, above uh, Ambassador Ramos and I went in and uh, I was really delighted with the response. Yeah. So you didn't bring this to the action group, you just got up off your backside and went and did this yourself? Yes, yes, well I would have, it, it, it was um, at that stage it was discussed with, with some members of the action group but uh, the history of that is that um, uh, I, I sit on the Daisy Hill Hospital Pathfinder group and so I'm familiar with the difficulties in attracting doctors and I, I was very familiar with what the Department of Health was doing regarding staffing at Daisy Hill Hospital. The Pathfinder was set up as a result of a previous campaign to prevent the closure of the ED department at Daisy Hill. So there were some discussions with the group but it was something I just decided then let's go for this and let's see what happens. So Francis yeah. this is quite alarming because yeah. the Department of Health uh -huh. over many years have spent millions of pounds Yes trying yes. to attract doctors from abroad yes and they couldn't do it yes that's right so yes why suddenly you're sitting at home and you get thinking about cuba why did they not do that that, that that's a very good question um my, my my own theory on that is that i i think bureaucracies um find it very difficult to operate outside the box they have a conventional way of doing things and they... So what you're actually saying is there's nobody switched on there? Yeah, well... The they're light they're hasn't been turned they're on? They're, 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 they're not... The, uh, departments of health are here are generally not known for, for their original thinking when it comes to, to things like this and you could say it about many different democracies. They did spend the public's money on... Yes. So surely they did yes. a bit of research. So somebody yes. has to hold their hand up and say, hang on a minute, yes. I've made a mistake here. I should have maybe thought of that. Yes, they should. They, well, they should have. They should have thought of it, and <coughs> I, I would encourage the Department of Health to, you know, to, to take bold action and to look be beyond what is seen to be the conventional way of doing things. Because I think we need to do that if we're going to solve um, our, our, our staffing crisis here in, in, in Northern Ireland. It is a crisis now, and um, unconventional and irregular ways of going about things need to be looked at in order to, to get solutions. The now old, you touched on red tape yeah, and yeah. I gather that we're going to have problems because there's barriers now. The Department of Health have come back to you and said look we have a problem here. Yes, I, I uh, rep reported what the meeting with, with, with the Cuban ambassador to the Pathfinder group who, who has senior medical officials from, officials from the Department of Health on it. And uh, they, there, there then was a series of correspondence between the Department of Health here and the Cuban Embassy in Dublin. And it transpired that they came back to me and said, look, we, 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 can't, we can't do this because Cuba is on a blacklist of countries that the, the UK and the Department of Health here cannot say they can't recruit from. And the other issue was they said that because Cuba uh, is a communist country um, that they can't um, they can't take contracts out of the government. They have to be contracts with individual doctors, right? But I replied to that the the Cuban authorities said to me that they're willing they're willing to discuss this about contracts. So what I'm saying is that the the Department of Health here need to be proactive on all of this. You know, all, all these things are possible. Uh, we have a shortage of doctors. It'll take years for new doctors to come out after they've been trained. So why not utilise this opportunity? Think of the great um, benefit it would be to, to reducing the long 
waiting lists that we have. And there's an old saying, if there's a will, there's a way. If there's a will, there's a way, and and absolutely, yeah. So we have a new government now at Stormont, and we have a new health minister in Robin Swan. Yes. Will you be actively looking to talk to Robin Swan quite urgently about this? And and what's your hopes there? I I would be be getting in touch with with Robin Swan as soon as possible, because I'd want to talk to him about this offer from Cuba. They've offered all middle-grade doctors, surgeons, a uh, whole range of medical professionals uh, it's just incredible i was saying to them look let's let's get our heads together and work out a way of trying to remove these barriers and make this possible because it is possible o- all of this is possible as you say it just takes the will the will to do it um so yeah so the hopes for the future would be would be another another question i think yeah, certainly the hopes for the future is, is always uh, what we do hope. We always hope for something good. But yeah. within the health service, we're in crisis at the moment. Yes, and okay. it's not going to be fixed easily. Yes, okay. uh, so yes, uh, yeah. there are a lot of questions there. There are a lot yes. of questions to be answered. Again, yes. Robin Swan's only into yes. the job. So we've yes. got to give him a chance. Yes, okay. But this okay. position of having doctors abroad yes. in yes. Cuba saying, I want to come over to Northern Ireland and yeah. I want to help this hospital. Yes. And there's red tape holding it back. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. is something yeah. we need to sort out immediately. Yes, the, the Minister of Health would need to look at ways of removing that, that red tape. And I, I think now because of the very fluid political situation we're in in regards to Europe, it could be possible that all this could change. I see that Recently, last, last year, members of the royal family visited Cuba and uh, there was a whole uh, contingent of officials that went with them. So I would hope that there would be opportunities to open up a relationship with Cuba in the, in the So future. you're going to go and ask the question? Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. And you're going to yep. come back and talk to us? Yes, we're going to come back and talk to you. And um, the only thing that concerns me is that um, with, the, with the storm up and going again in the Department of Health, we've now a new minister in the Department of Health, is that I haven't been hearing too much about how the Department of Health is going to be made more accountable. Well, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Conversation with Robin Swan. Come back and talk to us, and we'll tell the story right here. Thank you, Francis. Thank you. If you have a story you'd like us to feature, contact us by Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. Also, email us at storytocamera at gmail.com. Thanks for listening to our latest Story to Camera.